The story of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy from Chicago who was abducted and then murdered while visiting family in Sumner, Mississippi in 1955 is not unique with regards to the violence and the disregard for black life in that time period. It is unique in the amount of media coverage that it received, and that's because his mother, Mamie, insisted that the body be displayed for thousands to bear witness and a photograph with the intention that the photographs be published. The accused faced a speedy trial back in Mississippi that lasted five days and began 12 days after the murder. Deliberation by an all-white, all-male jury lasted for an hour and seven minutes before the men were declared innocent. The story of Emmett Till has been told for three generations in black families to help little boys understand the brutality that lived in the hearts of some white people and the tolerance of injustice that lived in the hearts of many more. Come with me, Black in Time, as I tell the story week by week, as reported by Jet Magazine in 1955 and by the Johnson Media Company in the years that followed. Emmett Till was murdered when my mother was two years old, and my father was four, and yet they knew the story well, as did all of my friend's parents. You could almost draw a line between Emmett Till, Rodney King, Trayvon Martin, and George Floyd, and Maude Arbery. All of these cases demonstrated a very brazen disregard for the humanity and the well-being of black men involved, which itself was a well-known phenomenon, although oftentimes denied. However, the images, video, and circumstances of these killings elevated their cases into the public consciousness. Each of them became symbols of the abuse that blacks were facing in America during the decade that they died in, or in the case of Rodney King, that he was beaten in. I think that Emmett Till's story is as important today because it demonstrates just how difficult it was for justice to be served when blacks were being harmed by white Americans during the 20th century. Accountability in the form of convictions for perpetrators in the Arbery and the Floyd cases represent much needed progress in the realm of justice for black victims of white crime. Now, I grew up in a very quiet suburb in the 1980s. It was racially integrated and extremely peaceful. There were no racial incidents, no crime, basically zero police presence. It was just a bunch of families in a small town that at that time was very easy to miss. When I was 10 years old, my mother decided that my brothers and I needed to see a different side of America. The Eyes on the Prize documentary series was airing on PBS, and she would record it every night while we were sleeping. I know the one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. And then she showed it to us after school. Of everything I saw in that documentary, the kidnapping of Emmett Till and his murder stood out the most. When they showed his face, I remember turning away and hiding my eyes. I was definitely traumatized in that week when I was told and I became to understand what had happened to black Americans in our country. Now, Emmett Till's story was also told in the pages of Jet Magazine as it unfolded week by week. It was a habit of Jet in those days to dedicate the first few pages of the magazine to what I like to call, this is what white folks did to us this week. I think this is now important because there are people who try to minimize the terror and the abuse that blacks were subjected to in the 20th century. The records left in the pages of Jet magazine will provide proof of exactly what happened, week by week, month by month, year after year, for several decades straight. A Jet magazine issue from August 25th had this listed as his first story. This is a week before Emmett Till's kidnapping was reported. It read, Second Negro Leader Slain in Mississippi Vote Drive. A 60-year-old Mississippi farmer, Lamar Smith, who defied threats to quit trying to get Negroes to vote or be killed, was shot to death by a white man on Courthouse Square in Brookhaven. It was the state's second civil rights killing in four months. Police arrested Noah Smith, no relation, a 51-year-old white farmer, he is charged with shooting the Negro in the abdomen with a 38 caliber gun. He died instantly. A Google search of the case brought me to this report, which states that two other men gave themselves up in connection with the shooting, Mac Eugene Smith and Charles Denver Falvey. The trio never went to trial for Smith's murder. And two weeks after Emmett Till's murder, they published a story concerning a nine-year-old boy who was also abducted from his home 
by grown white men and beaten badly. This was because of a water gun fight with one of the men's sons. September 22, 1955, Jet Magazine featured this snippet. It read, A nine-year-old Hampton, Georgia boy, Walter T. Colbert, who was abducted from his home by two white men and brutally beaten after a water pistol shooting affair during which the white boy squirted water into his face, vanished from his home along with his parents. The boy was reportedly taken from the home of his parents, James and Lillian Colbert, by a councilman and a commissioner, both in quotes, and beaten until the men's knuckles were bloody red. A local justice of the peace refused to issue a warrant against the men. And the family later fled the town, apparently in fear for their lives. So again, you see the pattern of violence against black people and no consequences for the white offenders. In other words, the government and law enforcement are cooperating with criminal behavior against black people. You have to take a minute to appreciate that fact if you're going to fully understand the world that my parents and grandparents came from. One should note that this magazine was not anti-white propaganda. They reported stories like this, showing that some white folks had goodwill. In August 25th, a week before Emmett Till was abducted, they had the following concerning a heroic white man. Despite warning that he wait for the Coast Guard to arrive on the scene, a Charleston, South Carolina white man. L. E. Cribb rode a boat to aid two Negro fishermen on an explosion gutted shrimp trawler and rescued one of them. If I had been a little sooner, I could have saved the other man, said Cribb, who brought to shore 35 year old Richard Hart. They also had a section about just strange or scandalous crime inside of the community. Like this one that says, Husband shoots wife when he catches her lover running out the back door. Or, Husband bites off the ear of his father in law in the August 25th issue. Sometimes it was just stories about the unexpected, like these hornets killing a farmer. Or maybe they were racist hornets, and that's why it was important. I don't know. They don't really say. Okay. But anyway, my point is, Emmett Till's story was one of many reports on the injustice and the brutality of the era, which the Johnson Publishing Company took it upon themselves to draw attention to at every opportunity. In fact, when this story was written, they had not yet found his body. So it wasn't initially going to be that big of a deal. It was going to be like these other cases that I've reported. The original article read as follows. Chicago boy, 14, kidnapped by Mississippi whites. A 14-year-old Chicago junior high student, Emmett Bobo Till, who was kidnapped by a trio of three gun-toting whites early Sunday morning while visiting relatives in Money, Mississippi, was feared a lynch victim because he whistled at a white girl, in quotations. LaFleur County authorities admitted that we are afraid some harm has been done to the boy. Sheriff George Smith told Jet that the boy's disappearance was being investigated and that one of the white men, money grocer Roy Bryant, was being held in jail without bond for questioning. Meanwhile, the sheriff ordered the family of 64-year-old Reverend Moses Wright a retired Church of God in Christ minister and the boy's uncle take his family from the town for their own safety. The minister, however, refused to leave his home after making arrangements to hide his wife, three sons, and two visiting Chicago grandsons, Curtis and Wheeler Barker. According to the witnesses, the Whites broke into Reverend Wright's home at 2 a.m. on Sunday, demanding the boy. After warning Reverend Wright that they would be back to get him, they threatened to horsewhip his elderly wife. Later, Brian admitted kidnapping the boy, but talking to him in his store and then releasing him to home. The boy's mother, Mrs. Mamie Bradley, said reportedly went into town Wednesday afternoon when the incident occurred. All right, again, you see this pattern where if a black person was done wrong by a white person, it was on them to leave town as if they were in danger for simply being the victim of a crime by a white person. And I guess it was because if they were a victim, then there was a possibility they would testify. And if they testified, they were going to be harmed. So it was best just to leave. It was full-blown terror going on down there in the South. Then in the September 15th issue of Jet Magazine, the article that would make history. The first paragraph states that, Aroused by America's first lynching in four years, the kidnapping and murder by three Mississippi white men of chubby 14-year-old Chicagoan Emmett Lewis Bobo Till because he whistled at a white woman. Leaders of both white and Negro groups demand stern and immediate action against the barbarians. Um, 
I think this was not the first lynching in four years unless you define it as a racial motivated killing with three or more persons present because racially motivated murders were happening rather frequently at that time. And also, kind of messed up to call him chubby when you report that he's dead. I mean, jeez, why to kick a man when he's down? Mississippi Governor Hugh White was quoted as saying, we cannot believe that responsible officials of a state will condone the murdering of children on any provocation. Swamped with similar protesting telegrams, Governor White answered, Mississippi does not condone such conduct, calling the Mississippi white people horrified by the act. A white newspaper editor named Tom Shepard described the killing as nauseating and way beyond the bounds of human decency. The kidnapping episode came to a stark and shocking end when the youth's nude body waited with a 200-pound iron gin mill fan was discovered by a fisherman in the shallow waters of the Tallahatchie River. The fan was wired around his neck. Recovering the body, officers found a bullet hole one inch above his right ear. The left side of his face has been crushed to the bone. The article goes on to say that FBI officials in Washington said they could not enter the case because it was a local murder. But, just a little poking around, and I found 18 U.S. Code 241, which states that if two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district, in, f in the free exercise and enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States, or because of his having exercised the same, seems to suggest that they had violated federal law, by conspiring to injure the young boy, conspiring to injure him in a violation of his constitutional rights. This was enacted in June 25th, on June 25th, 1948, so it had been in place for seven years prior to Emmett Till's murder. I'm not a lawyer or an attorney, but I believe this means that the federal government could have actually done something, but did not. The other side of this is that his murder trial began 12 days after the actual murder, which is really, really fast. I believe that those attorneys in the entire community cooperated to make this happen. Because if they brought charges against the men and found them not guilty, then the federal government would be unable to charge them with the same crime. Because it would be double jeopardy. So even though the federal government could have done something, they didn't. And even if they had changed their mind, it was too late. Because they had already brought them into trial with state charges. They also mentioned in the article that the man... Moses Wright, the boy's great uncle, had only one shotgun shell the night the men came. And I think they mentioned that because my grandfather once told me, uh, he grew up in a rural area in Georgia in the 20s and 30s, that shotgun shells and rifle bullets were like white supremacist repellent. If the Klan tried to ride on their little town or their neighborhood, they would just start shooting. And in general, the Klan didn't come for a gun battle, so they would just leave. They came for like a lynching or something horrible like that, but they didn't really want to get into a gunfight. So if you fired at them, they would generally go away. Lastly, I'm going to show the images as they appeared in Jet Magazine back in that issue on September 15th, 1955. Just a warning to anybody who doesn't want to see the images. Okay, so a week later, September 22nd, Jet featured the Emmett Till murder on the cover of the magazine again. And in that article, they speculated that no justice would be realized, and this was based on what happened to another murder victim in a town called Belzoni, Mississippi. The victim was Reverend George W. Lee. So I quickly checked the May 1955 issue of Jet, and I found the following story. Reverend George Lee had sworn that despite the threats, he would not remove his name from the town's qualified voter list. The day of his death, he was threatened by whites with death if he did not remove his name. That night, two gun blasts near the edge of the Negro part of town were heard just before his vehicle swerved into a house. The lower left side of his face was torn and the jawbone was torn away by the blast. The minister staggered out of the car and he was ushered into a passing taxi as bystanders gathered. But before the taxi could reach Humphrey Memorial Hospital, he was dead. Local police took a look at the body and decided that he had just lost control of the car and died as a result of the crash. They concluded that the mysterious lead-like pellets in the dead man's jaw were merely dental fillings and that no autopsy was necessary. Newspapers carried the death as a freak 
death. So what you see here is just a few months earlier, a murdered black man uh, was essentially erased by the white media, the white police, and white officials cooperating with the criminals who killed him. So there was full cooperation of the community to murder any black person who was agitating or trying to disrupt the social order. Uh, they also state that phone operators refused long distance calls from Negroes attempting to call people in the town of Belzoni to discuss the murder. They ended up having to drive down in order to speak in person. Two Negro doctors were called in to examine the body and they reported that his jaw contained pellets fired at close range. A third black physician who also worked with the NAACP said that he found an irregular opening on the side of the face and the appearance of powder burns. Eyewitnesses to the event said that the vehicle pulled up beside him and fired a bullet into the rear tire and as the car slowed down, they fired point blank into the reverend's face. Witnesses described the occupants in the car as two white men and a black man, the black man being the finger man who helped them ensure they shot the correct target. But as the FBI appeared to investigate, witnesses started to disappear or change their story. No one was ever brought to justice for this murder. Now, his body was also displayed for about 2,000 people to see, and the photographs were published in Jet Magazine, just like Emmett Till. But it's clear that this did not have the same far-reaching impact as Emmett Till's images, despite the fact that they are also a little gruesome. Part of this is possibly because the wound was repaired before it was photographed. And also, the simple fact that Emmett Till was a child. A week later, September 29th, Emmett Till's murder is still mentioned on the cover of Jet Magazine. At this time, they mentioned that there was a third man involved who was either a witness or an accomplice. They mentioned that two men who abducted Till from the home took him back to a car where his wife, Mrs. Bryant, and a third man were waiting. Mrs. Bryant was not taken into custody despite her close proximity to the murder because according to the sheriff, quote, she has two youngsters to take care of. The October 6th cover of Jet Magazine again mentions the Till murder, making reference to the strange trial of his murderers. They say that the five-day trial took on the appearance of a Sunday school picnic. The judge opened a Coca-Cola and started sipping it while the jury was being selected. Spectators promptly opened beers while cold beverages were being sold by young boys. Sheriff H. C. Strider escorted the suspects into court each morning and greeted Negro reporters each morning with Good morning, niggas. The suspect's children were permitted to sit with them in the courtroom, and children played in the aisles. The men were permitted to use the judge's bathroom, while all the Negroes were left to use the facilities three blocks away. Deliberation by the all-white, all-male jury took one hour and seven minutes before they emerged and issued a not guilty verdict. My guess is that they discussed football for about an hour and three minutes. This outcome was protested as far away as New York and it was reported in Life Magazine, the leading mainstream media magazine and a news source that did not often discuss racial conflict. Addressing an estimated 50,000 persons, Harlem Councilman Earl Brown urged that a refugee committee be formed at once to bring Negroes out of Mississippi. Emmett's mother, Mamie, appeared at the event and called the acquittal a shame before God and man. In Chicago, 10,000 people appeared at separate events where Willie Reed, one of the star witnesses, spoke urging people to stop shouting and start helping southern negroes out now in the october 13th 1955 issue they tell the story of the great uncle's dramatic escape from mississippi now remember when it first went down he was told to hide his family which he did he hid his wife he hid his kids i probably shouldn't even said that he stashed his wife his grandchildren and his children at different people's homes so that he alone was resting in the house where the crime took place or where the child was abducted. They called him preacher because of his intense religious devotion and because he had been a reverend at a local church. So after the not guilty verdict, he came back to his house and he was dejected and confused and just sat on the porch listening to the breezes. His wife had already gone north to Chicago vowing never to return. He was thinking to himself that he might have to abandon this place that he loved because he loved fishing and hunting. This wasn't something he wanted to do. So he went inside and he laid down on his bed and dozed off and he said he was suddenly awakened from a dream where a voice kept saying, don't stay here. It ain't right. Get out, Uncle Moe's. He looked at his clock and it was 9.30 p.m. So he jumped up. He searched the house. There was nobody there. He circled the house, got in his truck, turned on the lights. Nobody. He mentions that a lot of people had told him that when it's quiet and it's still, 
that's when those white folks would kill me. They were supposed to be mean and low down, and they would stop at nothing to get back at smart Negroes. Maybe, I thought, those white folks are coming tonight. Maybe. My neighbors are right. He noticed that he didn't have enough gas to get to his brother's house, so he considered hiding in the cotton fields. He thought about going to a neighbor's house, but he said he kept telling himself, You ain't scared, Uncle Mose. You're a preacher. These people believe in you. He decided to go to his church in East Money, Mississippi, so that he could pray. He parked in the church, prayed and prayed, until he didn't hear that voice telling him to run. Then he locked all the church doors and slept in the truck. At dawn the next morning, he woke up and went back home. He found that his door had been broken down, beds overturned, and his neighbors told him that 30 minutes after he left, two white men came into his house with flashlights calling, Preacher! Preacher! The same way they did the night Emmett was taken. After learning that, he rounded up the three boys he had left with various friends, and he drove to his brother's house to catch a train to Chicago. He left his truck at the train station and told his brother to sell it. I want to thank you for listening. I'm going to conclude part one right here. Part two will be up in a week, and I'll see you then.